outer membrane acting as a, pieces of the outer membrane acting as potential toxins. The outer membrane also contains proteins like porins. Porin proteins form channels that small molecules can pass, like things that are 600 to 700 Daltons or less. So glucose is 180 Daltons, so you can see that porins can, can be sufficiently large to allow the flow of those types of molecules into the cell. Um, again, an important concept in, in understanding the function of the cell wall is that of osmotic protection. Osmotic lysis occurs when cells are in a hypotonic solution. So again, the, in that particular case, the, um, the solution has a lower solute concentration than the cell interior. And so water is always going to want to flow from low concentration of solutes to high concentration of solutes. So if you take a, a microbe with lots of solutes in its cytoplasm and put it into deionized water, that deionized water is going to flood into the cell and cause it to swell up and potentially burst. So the cell wall is its main um, protection against that. Lysozyme is an enzyme that actually breaks the N-acetylglucosamine and N-acetylmuramic acid um, backbone of the cell wall. So lysozyme is a compound that's present in our tears and saliva. It's in chicken egg whites. It's pretty pretty universal. So it's an interesting evolutionary mechanism that we that we you know humans and animals have produced. Not that we're not animal animals, <laughs> but uh, but animals in general have uh, devised to um, to keep um, bacteria in check. Penicillin inhibits peptidoglycan synthesis, and so by, by um, inhibiting the um, assembly of peptidoglycan, penicillin actually weakens bacteria and causes them to fall apart. So again, if, if, the, if a cell is treated with lysozyme or penicillin, um, they're definitely going to fall apart, if, especially if they're in a hypotonic solution. So if we look at that here, you've got um, a normal-shaped microbe, in the, but you add penicillin, which inhibits this guy from making making cell wall when it's dividing. So imagine that happens when this guy's dividing and making a making a daughter cell, the the new cell wall. So this is this is preformed cell wall. So it's already made, it's already put together. The penicillin's not going to do anything to it. But when this guy starts to divide and make a make an offspring, the offspring is going to have a really weak cell wall that's going to lack um, cross links. And so as a result, this guy is going to form a protoplast. It's, uh, the, 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 the cell will, will round up like this because its cell wall is so weak. If, it, if the medium is hypotonic, then water will flood in and that swelling will eventually cause lysis. And so again, the, um, these different phases of that process. A protoplast is a cell that completely lacks a cell wall. And so it rounds up like this. And then a spheroplast has some cell wall remaining. But anyway, in either case, it's just it's a it's a terrible state to be in if you're a bacterium. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so protein secretion in prokaryotes occurs through a few different secretion pathways: sec dependent, type three, um, which is a syringe, a type four systems. There's all kinds of different systems, but I'll focus on these three. Um, actually, I'll focus on this one, and maybe a just, and just mention these briefly. So um, the, the type 3 system is a syringe type system. So a lot of pathogenic bacteria like Salmonella, for example, have these little syringes that they build in their cell envelope and that, can, uh, that allows them to inject toxins into the, into the cell. Once they've injected the toxins, they can invade the cell and, and, and cause problems, you know, diarrhea and so forth. But it's not just Salmonella. Lots of microbes produce these little type 3 syringes. Um, type 4 secretion systems are used for mating. So whenever you see microbes, um, you know, transferring plasmids and things like that, they, they typically do it through a type 4 mechanism. And so again, type 4 conjugation allows a, an antibiotic resistant microbe to share an antibiotic resistance plasmid with, you know, a neighboring cell, for example. And that's often how antibiotic resistance travels through hospitals and so forth by microbes trading, um, sharing DNA through these conjugation systems. So, but the emphasis here will be on sect dependent. I'll get into type four um, down the road just a little bit, but um, sect dependent 
um, trans transmission, or I'm sorry, translocation occurs through a pretty basic mechanism um, in which a, and I'll actually, it's probably better to just look at it, in which um, <clears throat> you have an apparatus that's embedded in the plasma membrane. This protein here is often, is, is often referred to as SecYEG. So it's a series of, so it's three proteins that come together um, to make these barrels, to make this, you know, this, uh, this membrane, transmembrane barrel. And then there's sec A, which is an ATP hydrolase, and sec B, which, you know, recognizes the um, secreted protein. So in this particular case, sec stands for secretion. So if, imagine if this is a protein that, if it were to be made inside the cytoplasm and become active, could cause a lot of problems. Imagine if it's a, an enzyme that degrades DNA. And the last thing the bacterium would want is to unleash a bomb or, or let off a bomb in its own, inside its own house. <laughs> so um, the microbe will, will attach onto that protein a signal peptide. That signal peptide is a stretch of amino acids that, that targets that, pep, that peptide for secretion. So the signal peptide would be recognized by sec B and grabbed onto, and then sec B would transfer that protein to sec A. Sec A would hydrolyze ATP, and that would facilitate pushing the protein out of the cell. Once the protein gets out of the cell, a special enzyme called signal peptidase will remove the signal peptide. And so then the thing can become functional out here. Once the signal peptide is removed, this, the rest of the protein can fold up properly and become functional. Then the microbe can spit this out into the world or keep it in the periplasm to do some kind of job. So components external to the cell wall, I've mentioned a few things like capsules and fimbriae as you can see in this picture. So capsules, slime layers, S layers. Um, capsules are the main thing to focus on here. And capsules are usually composed of sugar, polysaccharide. They're typically well organized and not easily removed from the cell. So here's a picture of some um, um, capsules around bacteria. And so if we were meeting in the lab, we would have actually done a capsule stain. <laughs> but so here's some different shaped microbes. And this halo around the bacteria excuse me, it depicts their capsule. So you can see this clear halo around the bacteria. Here's a bacterium right here. So this is just, again, a, a way to stain the microbes to show capsule formation. And again, you can read about this in the lab manual. I'll have a little module on um, capsule staining. The functions of capsules include protecting from host defenses. So if a phagocy phagocyte comes to get a microbe that's invading a wound, these microbes with capsules can often resist um, being engulfed. Because they're made up of water and sugar, it can give them protection from harsh environmental conditions like drying. That's what this is, desiccation. So having a bag of water around you can give the microbes, you know, like a, you know, like having a camel, a camel pack on your bag, on your back, <laughs> whatever those things are called, <laughs> that you can um, take sips out of while you're hiking. Um, and obviously they're sticky, so they can give attachment to surfaces. A lot of the microbes on your teeth and the enamel of your teeth are capsule-forming bacteria, and that's something we also would have done in the lab, is looked at capsule-forming bacteria on your teeth. So um, additional structures include fimbria. Um, fimbria is singular, fimbriae is plural. These are short, thin, hair-like proteinaceous appendages that are sticking out into the world in the, in the thousands per cell. They help them attach to surfaces. So again, even if it's just a rock in a stream or, or, the, um, or a wound or a heart valve, um, some, in particular type 4 fimbria, require, are required for movement, a weird kind of movement called twitching motility or gliding. So they can actually imagine them putting out one of these little structures, almost like a grappling hook, throwing it out into the world and then pulling it back in which allows them to pull themselves along on surfaces if their flagella aren't going to be any, any, any use to them on those surfaces. They can, again, they can crawl essentially with type 4 fimbriae. So, so they're not just for attachment, they're also for, can also be for movement. And then the type 4, um, the type 4 um, <clears throat> um, apparatus that I'd mentioned before are also called sex pili or pillus.
And these things are similar to fimbriad, but they're longer, thicker, and less numerous, and they're required for conjugation or mating. So again, I mentioned the type 4 secretion apparatus. That's synonymous with sex pili that the microbes can use to exchange um, DNA. And so there's a picture of it here. So you can see fimbriae here in the thousands per cell, generally smaller and required for attachment, and then a massive type 4 conjugation apparatus or sex pillars linking this donor cell to this recipient cell. And then you can imagine if this my pointer is some DNA, uh, a plasmid containing antibiotic resistance can move through and give this microbe antibiotic resistance.